Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session, and I hope you are having a great time at reInvent. Few years back, I attended a training. It was called Take Back Your Life, and it was about effectively managing your emails. The trainer told us about three Ds. He said, if you want to manage your emails, you should either delete it or do it or delegate it. And that's when I realized that delegation is your great friend. So over the course of next 45 minutes, I would like to take you on a journey of how you can delegate access to your AWS environment and take your life back. I also have another session, session SEC 304, in the same room at 4.30, where I will cover how you can bring your own identities by federating access to your AWS environment. My name is Shon Shah, and I'm a product manager on the identity and access management team. I have been with AWS for three years now, and before this, I was with Microsoft for 10 years. So let's take a quick look at the agenda. We'll start with a couple quick definitions. Next, we'll look at the main delegation scenarios. Then, we'll cover some delegation fundamentals. And finally, we'll look at the scenarios in action using demos, quite a few demos. I hope at the end of this session, you would walk away with a solid understanding of how you can securely delegate access to your AWS environment. We do have five demos to cover, so I request you to hold on to your questions till the end of the session. I am available after the session and during the rest of the conference. So let's get started. When I say delegation, what I mean is you are providing users in other AWS accounts access to resources in your account. Federation, on the other hand, means that you are providing users in other identity stores access to resources in your account. And it took me some time to tease apart these two definitions. And these identity stores can be corporate identity stores, like Active Directory or LDAP, or these can be even social identity stores, Facebook, Google, or Amazon. As I mentioned earlier, we'll focus on delegation for this session and cover federation in the 4.30 session. Let's look at scenarios. We'll look at three scenarios. And the first one is the most basic form of delegation. You own an AWS account, and you want to delegate access to someone on your own team. The next one is delegating across account. And this can be an account that is within your company, or it can be outside your company. And typically, this will be one of our AWS partners. As you might already know, we have a very rich partner ecosystem. We have more than 7,000 SIs and more than 3,000 ISVs in our APN or AWS partner network. The third scenario would be about delegating access to AWS. And this can be an AWS service like Amazon Elastic Transcoder or AWS Data Pipeline that wants to act on your behalf. And finally, we'll look at the special case of delegating access to Amazon EC2 service and why it is magical. So before we dive into the demos, let's cover some fundamentals. We'll look at two fundamentals, roles and sessions. If you understand these two fundamentals, then understanding delegation in IAM is quite easy. So let's start with roles. roles in AWS mean nothing but a set of permissions that are granted to a trusted entity. This entity can be another AWS account or another identity provider. Roles have these two nice properties, security and control. When you use roles, there is no secret sharing involved. And you can easily revoke access by changing the permissions on the roles. So let's look at what are the permissions or policies that you can set on the roles. There are two, again. The first one is what we call it as a trust policy. And trust policy defines 
what are the trusted entities by this role. So if you look at the sample policy there, what it says is that this role is going to allow access to any user in account 1111. Other type of policy you can set on the role is called access policy. And these are the permissions that are granted to anyone that assumes this role. Now the JSON snippets that you see on the slide are the, the policies that you set within IAM console. I'm not going to go into the details of it because we have a session dedicated for that tomorrow. It's called Mastering Access Control Policies. So if you use roles, you get back sessions, AWS sessions, and these sessions allow you to grant temporary access to your AWS account. Temporary being the keyword, it's not like long-term access. And these sessions are generated by a service that we call as uh, STS, or Security Token Service. And you can obtain these by calling Assume Role API. And Assume Role API is the basis on which this cross-account access works in IAM. So we'll look at it in detail. So let's look inside the session. A session has four elements, access key ID, secret access key, session token, and expiration. Access key ID and secret access key is the symmetric credential. In plain English, it's just a shared secret between AWS and you. And I have seen some confusion around this uh, among the customers, so let me take a moment to talk about this. As people often confuse this with the EC2 key pair. EC2 key pair that you use when you launch an instance is an asymmetric credential, meaning there is a public key part and private key part, and you keep private key only with you, and public key is available to anyone. There is no secret sharing involved there, so just, a, just something to keep in mind. Session token is just a blob of data that you pass when you make an AWS API request. It lets us verify whether the session is valid or not. And how do we determine whether it is valid or not? By looking at the expiration. And expiration is what makes the sessions temporary. We have two types of uh, cr credentials in IAM. Long-term credentials or short-term credentials, or sometimes those are called temporary security credentials. When you create an IAM user in AWS and assign credentials, access key ID and secret access key, those are long-term, meaning until you revoke those credentials or until you delete that user, those are going to be valid. However, when you make assume role API call and get back the sessions, those are temporary. And how temporary are they? So for the assume role API, by default, the session is going to be valid for one hour, but you can change it so that it can be valid only for 15 minutes. The max is also one hour. Enough with the scenarios and fundamentals. Uh, now let's... Uh, look at the demos. So the first scenario that we look at is uh, delegation within account. So you have an account, you have some resources, EC2 instances, DynamoDB tables, EMR clusters, what have you. You create an IAM user, and then you grant permissions to that user. If you're here for Andres's talk, by default when you create a user, the user gets zero for permissions. You have to explicitly assign permissions for the user to do something. Then you can set credentials on that user. You can set username and password, which is used for the console access, or the access keys, which are used for the API access. And if the user has privileged actions, like if the user is allowed to create other IAM users or delete EC2 instances, then we highly recommend that you assign MFA, or multi-factor authentication device, uh, to the user. We support both hardware and virtual MFAs. Uh, and for hardware, we have two form factors. We have a Gmalto key form, or recently we also uh, started supporting the, key, uh, the credit card form factor, so you can easily carry it in your wallet. And for the, the virtual MFA, you can just use your smartphone and any uh, TOTP client time-based one-time password client, uh, and then 
that becomes your position factor. So it is a two-factor authentication. Username and password is your knowledge factor, and this becomes your position factor. So let's look at a demo in action. So I'm going to start with IM console. I'm going to go to the user section and create a user. Let's say test. I don't want this user to make any API calls, so I'm not going to assign any access keys and create. That's it. Let's look at the user. You can add the user to groups. Group is just a collection of users. And then you can attach policies to the user. And we do have a bunch of pre-built templates that you can use for various services, for read-only access, for user access. Or you can also use a policy generator. So if you know exactly the service and the action that you want the user to do, then you can choose a service, let's say AWS directory service, all actions, and then all resources, add a statement, and done. So it automatically generates the JSON policy for you. And this is a section where you can manage all the credentials for the user. You have access keys, then sign-in credentials, which is username and password. You can assign MFA device. We do have some ser services that support the signing certificates. So nothing groundbreaking, nothing new. This is just a warm-up demo. But I do want to call out a couple things that we added recently. You see the password last use field? That is something we made available recently. So if you own the account and then if you delegate access to your team members, now you can see when was the last time the user signed into the console. If it is not used, then it's a good indicator that you might want to disable or delete the account. We also uh, added support for credentials report. So this is a report. When you download the report, you just get a CSV files about all the IM users, their various credentials, and then the status of those credentials, whether there is MFA or not, whether the access key, uh, whether there is an access key or not, and so forth. So let's look at the second scenario, which is across account. Now it will get slightly more interesting. So this is, you have an account, and you have another team within your own company, and you want to delegate access to someone in that team. Here, you start with creating a role in your account. And as I mentioned, role is nothing but a set of permissions granted to a trusted entity. Then you trust another account. This will be your another team's account. You grant permissions. And the other account's administrator needs to create an IM user in that account so that the user can assume the role. And once the user assumes the role, now the user gets these temporary credentials to access resources in your account. Of course, if you are going to assign some privileged actions to someone else, we highly recommend that you uh, protect the role assumption using multi-factor authentication device. So let's look at a demo flow before we dive into the demo. I have my AWS account that I use, and I also, we also have our product management team's AWS account. What I want to do is I want someone in the, the team's account to access my account. So what I have done is that I have created a cross-account role in my account that trusts the team account, and it grants some EC2 permissions and some IAM permissions, no other permissions. On the PM team's account, there is an IAM user with permissions to assume this role in my account. To make things more interesting, I have a Python script which does following. First, it uses the demo user's credentials to authenticate and assume a role in my account. In return, it gets back the temporary security credentials. Using those credentials, it generates a console URL and then the user gets redirected to the console URL. Using this, that user can now access resources in my account. So let's see this in action now. I 
I'm going to start in the IM console in the role section. And let's look at the cross account sign in role. My account number ends with 6238, just a note. And the role in my account, you can see from the trust policy, trust the, the PM team account. And if we look at the access policy, it says all EC2 actions allow and only read only IM permissions on all the resources, no other permissions. Now let's take a look at the PM Teams account. So you can see it from the sign in link. This is the PM Teams account. I'm going to go to the user section and look at the demo user. So if I look at the user and then the access policy on that user, that user is allowed to assume a role in my account. By the way, only one role. So this user cannot assume any other role. Now let's take a quick look at the Python script. The script is available uh, on AWS security blog post. So you can download it and customize it uh, as you wish. So the first step is very simple. Just ask for the account ID and then the role name so that you can construct role on or Amazon resource name. The second step is to connect to STS and actually call the assume role. And by the way, this script will use the demo user's IAM credentials. Those will be stored in the environment variable where I run this script. Oops. So the third step is after assuming the role, it gets back the temporary credentials. And then it, get, it uses those credentials to get what is called as a sign-in token. And that sign-in token can be used to create a console URL. And that console URL gives access to, the, to my account. And then the final step is just to open, redirect the user to that console. So let's see this in action now. First, the usage, the account ID, and role name. So this is my account ID, ending with 6238, and then the role name that we looked at. So now it's going to assume the role. It assumes the role, is, it assumed the role and got back the credentials. Then it's going to use those credentials to get back the sign-in token, then construct the console URL, and redirect the user to that URL. So as you, you can see now, it is using the cross account sign in role from my account. And if I go to a service, let's say IAM, it works and it is showing my account. If I go to a service, let's say simple email service, it's going to get not authorized error. This is expected because remember on the cross account sign in role, the, uh, the permissions allowed were only IAM read only and EC, EC2 all. OK. Let's get back to the slides now. So now this is the second use case for the, the second scenario, delegation across account. So I have an account, and I want a partner to access my account because I'm using the partner's offering. The way to do that is creating a role in your account, trusting the partner's account, granting permissions, and using something called as external ID. And I will get to it in a minute. Then rest is same. The IAM user in the partner's account assumes the roles and accesses your account. So let's look at what's external ID. External ID is a piece of data that must be unique per customer of the partner. And it must be provided by the partner. And where it gets used is that Remember we talked about the trust policy on the role? In the trust policy, you add a condition which includes this external ID. So if you look at the policy, it says the trusted principle is the example corp, which is like a partner account ID. And the condition says that external ID must match whatever the ID the partner has issued to me. So why is this important? Or why is this even needed? Why, why should you go through the hoops of setting this up? It prevents, prevents something called as a confused deputy problem. How many of you are aware of confused deputy? 
only a couple hands, no worries. I was not aware of it uh, until a uh, few months back. So essentially what it does is that if someone just knows the name of the role in your account, that person cannot make the partner assume the role in your account just by the knowledge of the role name. Let's see this uh, in detail. Let's say there is a partner that has two customers, customer A and customer B. Both of these customers have created roles in their account. Both of these roles trust the partner's account. Since the role names are not unique uh, or not secret, there is nothing preventing customer A going to the partner software and say, like use role B, which is actually in the customer B's account. And since role B trusts partner's account, now the IM user in the partner's account can actually assume the role and enumerate the resources in customer B's account, which means though that information might be disclosed to customer A. Definitely something that you don't want to happen, right? In this case, partner's AWS account is the confused deputy. It is very easy to confuse that, uh, that account. And you can prevent that by doing this simple thing. Every customer, when they set the role's trust policy, add the condition saying that, I'm going to allow the partner to assume this role only if they send me the external ID as part of the assume role call. Customer A does it, customer B does it. Okay. On the partner side, when the IAM user assumes the role, it passes the customer specific ID that it has vended earlier. Okay. So far with me? Now see the same flow. Customer A asks partner's software to use role B. The, the IAM user in the partner account tries second step, which doesn't work now because partner sends the external ID for role A because customer A is what made the request. But on role B's trust policy, uh, the external ID is different. It is external ID for customer B. So the role assumption is not going to work. And hence, like, there is no d information disclosure or uh, even actions taken on some other customer's account. Make sense? OK, good. Let's see this in action now. I have my account. I have created a role, and I'm going to use one of our partner offerings. Trend Micro is, uh, has this offering called Deep Security for Web Apps. Uh, it provides security scanning for the web applications running on AWS. Now, I want to use Trend Micro, but I'm not going to share my access key ID and secret access key with them. Uh, ne neither should you, uh, for any partner for that matter. So I created a role, and trusted the Trend Micro account, gave it some permissions. IAM user in Trend Micro account is going to uh, authenticate and assume the role, get back the temporary security credentials, and then use those to access the account. By this time, I think you have seen the pattern. So let's see this in action. I'm going to start with the I am console. In the role section, I have the trend micro role that I have created. Let's look at the trust policy. Oops, sorry. It is trusting the trend micro uh, AWS account, and they make it available as part of their documentation, and also when you configure their offering. As you can notice, I am using external ID because I don't want to deal with the confused deputy problem. Let's look at the access policy. The access policy allows two EC2 actions, one ELB action, and two Route 53 actions. And if you notice, these are read-only actions. So I have confidence that they are not going to do like uh, any mutating actions within my account. OK. And this role ARN, or Amazon resource name, is the only thing that I'm going to give to the partner. So now let's look at the Trend Micro software. Sign in to the Deep Security for Web Apps. So this is their dashboard. I'm already scanning one application. Let's go ahead and try to add another. 
administration web applications, add a web application. And I'm going to add a web application that is hosted in AWS. And if you see now, it provides the account ID, the external ID, which is specific to me. If you try this, you will get a different external ID. And then the policy, the access policy that you should set on the role. And then once you do that, then you come back and just give the role ERN. We already have one, so I'm just going to give that and then select the region. So now when I click on list web apps, it's going to use the temporary security credentials obtained by assuming the role. And it can actually look inside my account and uh, list all the EC2 instances for uh, security scanning. So I never gave my secret access key to, to a partner. I would go one step further and say, Friends, don't let friends share their secret key. Not a good thing. Not a good thing for you and even for the partner because uh, if a partner is uh, maintaining the secret key for a bunch of customers, right? it's a liability, extra liability on their part too. Okay, let's get back to the slides. Okay, let's look at the third scenario. This is delegating access to AWS. Pattern is similar. The only thing that is changing is that now you are delegating access to AWS service rather than someone with some other team in your company or an AWS partner. And just because it's an AWS service, right, it doesn't need to be special. It should still have the same delegation semantics. You create a role in your account this time you trust the AWS services, AWS account, grant permissions, and the same flow. The user in that services account accesses your, your account. Let's take a quick look at this. So I'm going to start with IAM console. Okay. In the role section, I'm going to create a new role and say test. Next step. As I mentioned, there are pre-configured templates. I'm going to use the template for Elastic Transcoder service. And then you can see that it needs some S3 actions and uh, some SNS actions. And Elastic Transcoder, in case you don't know, uh, it's a service that, uh, that can take your media files and then convert those into audio and video codecs so that different uh, devices, uh, those can be rendered on different devices. So next step, and create a role. That's it. Now let's go back to the Elastic Transcoder service. They have this concept called pipeline, which is a queue to manage the transcoding jobs. So let's try to create a pipeline. Say test, the bucket where your media files are there. And now here, it will ask for a role. And the role that we just created test is available here. And then you can say that, OK, go ahead and use this role. You don't have to necessarily start with the Elastic Transcoder console. You, uh, sorry, IAM console. You can start here also. And we provide the convenience of creating the role in your account that the transcoding service will use. Delegating access to Amazon EC2. So this is the second use case in the third scenario. Uh, many customers have applications that run on EC2 instances. Now, if this application itself wants access to EC2, it is going to need the credential to access, right? It's a very interesting problem. Uh, how do you get these credential to the instance? Instances can come and go, right? That's the whole idea of cloud, elasticity and flexibility. What I have seen is a couple of patterns when I talk with customers. They either take the access key ID and secret access key, and sometimes even the root credentials, 
and embed them in the AMI or Amazon machine image. Or the other pattern that I have seen is when you launch an EC2 instance, you can specify something called as user data. And uh, that user data is something that is available from within the instance. Now, both of these options are not secure. Here is the reason why. Let's say if you have an uh, AMI uh, that has embedded credentials, you can share the AMI with anyone. So if you share it with someone, and someone launches an instance from that, now they have access to your account. And if it is a root credentials, which you should never use, now they have uncontrollable access to your AWS account. Uh, even with the user data, when you pass it, uh, it, it is available as a clear text inside the instance. And if you're scripting the instance creation, then you have to have these credentials inside the scripts. So you don't want your credential to be lying around in clear text. Uh, so then how do we solve that problem, right? That's where delegating access to Amazon EC2 becomes special and interesting. You start in the same way. Create a role in your account. This time, you trust Amazon EC2 service, okay? Then grant permissions. These are the permissions that your application is going to need. Then you do one thing. And that thing is, when you launch an instance, you just say that, hey, I want to launch the instance with this role. If you do that simple step, here is what happens. EC2 automatically assumes the role in your AWS account and makes those credentials available to the instance. Not only that, if you use the AWS CLI or AWS SDK, these automatically use those credentials. So you don't have to change your application or anything. And the other thing is EC2 not only delivers the credential to the instance, it keeps on rotating it multiple times a day. So think about it. The credentials are delivered for you, rotated for you, and all you did was launching an instance with a role. I have seen many features in security, but I, I sincerely believe that this is one of those features that have achieved a great balance of security and usability. So let's see this in action. The demo flow is simple. Let's say you have a bunch of EC2 instances on which you have your application running. You create a role in your account. In this case, I'm going to allow only S3 access, not any other access. And when you launch an instance with the role, the credentials are made available to the instance. And then the application on the instance can access the AWS services. Access to S3 will be allowed. To DynamoDB, it will not be allowed. Let's see the demo. Starting with IAM console. In the role section, I have already created a role, which is a demo role. Let's look at the trust policy. Here, you will see that the role trusts EC2 service. And the access policy says allow only S3 access for all resources. Let's go back and look at the EC2 instance. I have already launched the instance with the role. And you can see that here. So this is the instance. And if I scroll down here, you will see that this is the IAM role which is the role that I just showed you. I'm actually on that instance right now. So I'm going to run this command called AWS configure. This is the AWS CLI command. And what it does is that it tells whether this command, command window session has any AWS credentials configured. So no access key ID, no secret access key. Region is default and output format is default. So now, let's try to see if I can run another AWS command, AWS S3 LS. This is a command which just lists the bucket in, in the account. Boom. It was able to list all the buckets in my AWS account. And the reason that it was able to do was the AWS CLI automatically picked up the credentials that were delivered by the EC2 service. Now let's try the DynamoDB list tables command. And this will fail with access denied because the role 
had access to only S3, S3 service, but not any other service. And I often get asked this question like, okay, so where are these credentials available? So there is a URL that we call uh, instance metadata URL. It's a fixed location that is available on every EC2 instance, whether it is Windows, Linux, uh, and the URL is on the screen, 169.254. Uh, and then if you just curl the URL, you can get the credentials. Access key ID, secret access key, and token. Okay, And as you can see, there is expiration also. So you might ask now, Sean, you have been telling us never share your secret key with anyone, but you yourself are showing this on a recorded session. Well, I'm showing access key ID and secret access key, but I'm showing only part of the session token. Uh, un unless you have the entire session token, those two are not going to be very useful. So yes, it is still secure. So let's get back to the slides. So in summary, we looked at three scenarios. You can use IAM users to securely delegate access within your account. You can use IAM roles to delegate access across account. And this can be some, someone inside your company or outside your company, like an AWS partner. You can use service roles to securely delegate access to an a AWS service, like Amazon Elastic Transcoder, AWS Data Pipeline, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, so on and so forth. And finally, you can delegate access to Amazon EC2 if you have applications running on EC2 instances that want access to the EC2, uh, to the AWS services. Here is a slide where I have the links. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is AWS Identity. Uh, we also have a AWS security blog. Uh, and in fact, this blog came out of the suggestion from the first reInvent. When we talked with the customers, right, they said, yeah, I mean, we have, you have the AWS blog, but we need security-specific content there. And that's where we post almost uh, once a week or uh, once every two weeks. The Python script that I showed, the cross-account sample, that's available on the security blog. I also have a link for that. And we also have details page and IAM forums. The product management team is quite active on the IAM forums. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them, and we would be happy to answer those. With that, thank you so much for your time. And I would highly appreciate if you can provide feedback on the session.